Hi folks, Pixel Pedant here, and it's once again time to talk about Imagic. To talk about what sort of shenanigans they got up to in the early 80s, and to talk about what came to the TI-99 foray from their selection of classic games. This time I'll be covering a game I really, really enjoy, Wing War. So that'll be nice. And on the other hand, I'll be talking about the death of Imagic. So, oh well. In the past two episodes in this series, I discussed Imagic's 1983 titles Fathom and Moonsweeper, one of which I really like and one of which I really don't. Those two really represent the end of an era for Imagic, Fathom being the last game designed by Rob Fulop for release by Imagic, he of Demon Attack fame, and Moonsweeper being the last Imagic release by Bob Smith. Bob Smith stayed with the company for a couple more years, but Moonsweeper was his last design under the Imagic brand. So if this was the end of an era, and I really think it was, well, what came next? Wing War, for one thing, but it didn't come out of nowhere. It's one of a few titles Imagic announced at Summer CES 83, and it's one of a number that we're still waiting for release when the market went completely kaput in the fall. As far as Imagic's plans for Fall and Winter 83, Billboard magazine had a good list of Imagic's Summer CES 83 title announcements in its June CES preview that year, and that offers a good look forward into Imagic's last hurrah in the industry. The new titles from there, which still hadn't been released as of the Fall 83 crash, were Hop To It, Flap, and Tarantula. All the others, Fathom and Moonsweeper aside, are ports or previously released games. We heard a flap before in a Magic's joint announcement with TI at CES. So, well, what happened to Hop To It, Flap, and Tarantula? They all got renamed before release, for one thing, so in that sense at least, Hop To It, Flap, and Tarantula were never heard from again. And this isn't the first time Imagic did this with their product announcements, either. Earlier on in 83, Imagic announced Escape from Argus, only to actually release it as No Escape instead. So, yeah, <laughs> somewhat uncertain in their product naming choices. This being the case, September's issue of Electronic Entertainment has the news that Tarantula, Hop To It, and Flap are now... Laser Gates, Quick Step, and Wing War. Web War is another unpublished Magic project from this period, so I'm kind of curious whether they were going for some naming synergy there with Wing War, or maybe just one inspired the other. Could be. Regardless, Flap was a pretty boring name for a game where you're a fire-breathing dragon, so Wing War's a definite improvement. It's also kind of odd in its own right, though, given there's no war going on in the game, really. You're just a dragon who's a crystal enthusiast, who collects them for powers. And surely there are cooler things to call a game about a fire-breathing dragon than Wing War. But I guess with Dragonfire already in their library, they couldn't use that, and, well, Wing War it is. So, Flap was announced at Summer CES, and it became Wing War in September, not long after. Before we look at what Wing War turned into in its released versions, though, let's look at what releases Imagic was promising at this stage. Imagic's UK catalog from the period helps here, as it has a well-timed and pretty complete listing of intended Wing War versions. What we get there is versions planned for Atari 2600, Atari Computers, Intellivision, Vic 20, and ColecoVision. Not all of which happen, unsurprisingly, given a Magic's implosion over the course of the next year. So what we get is pretty limited, ultimately. For 2600, we get a very bare-bones Europe-only release of Wing War. For Atari computers, a cartridge is never released, though Wing War is later distributed in a disc-based compilation of Imagic games called Imagic 123. That also includes Laser Gates and Quick Step. The Intellivision version was never released and unfortunately doesn't survive as far as we know. But we do have surviving stills and footage of it. The Intellivision version screens were used pretty widely for cross-platform marketing a Wing War, so images are easy to come by even if the game itself isn't. 
On the other hand, there's no evidence I can find that the listed VIC-20 version was ever undertaken or even seriously marketed. And there's the ColecoVision version as well, that was released, though with limited marketing given Imagic's means at the time, and low volume, making it quite rare today. And that brings us finally to the ti 99 a version, which, maybe you noticed, wasn't mentioned in the early multi-platform marketing in the UK. Here, instead of doing what I normally do, looking at how the original inspired the TI-99 version, I guess I'll explain why I'm not going to do that. Reason being, Fathom and Moonsweeper, which I'd last covered, were originally VCS games whose ports to other platforms followed in the VCS version's footsteps to lesser or greater extents. So it made sense to look at them in that way as VCS designs that were translated either well or badly to other platforms. Wing War, on the other hand, was a multi-platform game right from the get-go whose VCS version was never released widely, and was never released at all in North America, making it pretty much irrelevant to the bigger Wing War picture. Wing War's VCS, ColecoVision, and Intellivision versions don't really look very similar to one another at all, so it makes sense to look at them as what they were. Games that were definitely designed based on the same design document, but games that mostly don't play very similarly, or look very similar to each other at all. The unsurprising exception to this is the ColecoVision and TI-99 versions, which look predictably similar, being based on the same graphical assets given their shared VDB architecture. So I do have a few things to say about what's similar and what's different between the TI-99 and Coleco Wingmore versions. Before I get into that though, before I get into the differences, Let's talk about Wing War's basic design premises, the design concepts that all these versions have in common. Galico Wing War still features some of the Magic's classic production values and explains the premise like this. Countless ages before humans walked the earth, great flying dragons fought to survive. The uncharted world was filled with their natural enemies, but the dragons had to go on danger-filled adventures driven by primal need. Outside the safety of their underground den were the crystal elements of fire, air, and water, sources of power and longer life. All these crystals gathered together created super crystals with enough power to win the ultimate prize, the diamond treasure. So that's pretty flowery and vague. But the later, and as I say, super bare bones, 2600 version brings things down to earth a bit with its equally bare bones explanation of what the game's about. So let's take a look at that alternate version. Hunt and destroy natural enemies to score points and create valuable crystals. Gather fire, air, and water crystals to gain power and defensive strength. Be sure to keep fire and water crystals apart. Create super crystals by gathering all three elements, then make a daring raid through the secret passage to capture a sparkling diamond. Find and bring back dragon eggs to win extra lives. In short, you're a dragon, you can shoot fire, you live in a cave, and you collect crystals to make better crystals to make you more powerful. And then after that, you hunt for a treasure. Beyond those common ideas, though, gameplay and controls differ quite a bit between the versions. Since the TI-99 version was never released, we unfortunately don't have pack-in materials for its own version of the game's lore. Which is too bad, because this kind of game really needs a manual, and some aspects of the TI-99 design are unique to that version, and it'd be neat to have more lore. So in consideration of just how hard it is to figure out an early 80s adventure like Wing War without the help of documentation, I've created a manual for it. That's based on the lore and structure of the ColecoVision version's manual, but rewritten for the TI-99 version's items, gameplay, and mechanics. And you can find it linked in the description here. I recommend referring to it if you're going to give Wing War a try. The ColecoVision Wing War manual is also helpful, and it was for me, but there are major differences, so a fair bit of what it says is just not true for the TI-99 version. Despite the similar art, there definitely are big differences between those two versions. Maybe the biggest design difference is that in the TI-99 version, the terrain is destructible and destroying it is an important game mechanic. 
you need to destroy terrain to find some of the game's items and areas. Whereas terrain can't be destroyed in the Coleco version, and so that mechanic is just not used at all in gameplay. Most other differences aren't as wide-ranging as that one, though. Where and how you find each crystal type differs. Eggs grant lives in the Coleco version, but grant points in the TI-99 version. Stuff along those lines. Another big difference, though, is the decision to make ColecoVision Wing Wars controls resemble ColecoVision Fathoms controls. More than, for example, TI-99 or 2600 Fathoms controls. In the Coleco version, pressing the side button while holding the control stick in a direction flaps you in that direction you're pointing. Just holding the control stick in a direction alone does nothing. Personally, I'm not a fan of that approach, and I prefer the Joust-style TI-99 controls where joystick position just inherently propels the dragon in the direction you're pointing, while flapping is only used to keep you up in the air. Imagic first used this kind of directional flapping control design in their Intellivision version of Fathom. I wasn't a big fan of it there, and I'm not a big fan of it here. Even if you want to ditch the Joust-style mechanics for this directional flapping scheme, this doesn't seem like a great way to go about it. The underlying design made more sense on the Intellivision, since treating the control disc as a directional touch input device, you know, that makes sense, that's what it is. But imitating that design on the ColecoVision controller seems to me to just be leaving you with a worse version of a design that was questionable to begin with. As far as the larger design goes, the TI-99 and Coleco versions really do play like different games by different people. Games that just happen to share a design document and most of their graphical assets. So the main similarity is graphical, and even that only goes so far. Most background patterns are shared in common, but many of the sprites aren't. The TI-99 version uses an entirely different dragon sprite and flight animation and it's wiped out some of the terrain patterns to make space for its fancy title graphics. We've got a pretty good snapshot of where the TI-99 version's graphics started, though, as an early prototype does survive. So, let's take a look at that and see where this version started out. This version's a bit rough around the edges, and it's pretty incomplete. You can see the main dragon sprite is a two-layer variation, and nothing from that design survived into the final version. For good reason, I'd say, given the light red and magenta coloring doesn't show up well on either the sky or the cave background, so pretty much anything else works better. And happily, that palette didn't come with the redesign of the sprite. The early Proto has a few things in common with the ColecoVision version, which it doesn't with the later TI-99 version, and those differences mostly don't do the Proto any favors at all. Namely, your dragon's fire doesn't regenerate. Once you use up your dragon fire, it's just gone, unless you can recover crystals without it. As a quality of life improvement, I figure the regenerating dragon fire, which you do get in the final version, is definitely preferable. As well, in this version, dragon fire doesn't destroy terrain. It just passes through it, like in the ColecoVision version. So I'm glad the final version made things more interesting by using destructible terrain in gameplay. That's definitely one of the most interesting parts of the final design. And maybe most importantly, like the ColecoVision version, you can only turn and move by flapping in a desired direction. And that design does happily get changed in the final version to a more conventional Joust-style control scheme, thank goodness. The same style of control we saw in TI-99 Fathom, but not in ColecoVision Fathom. But one thing that got taken away that I actually regret being changed a little bit is the two sprite animated crystal found in the Proto and in the ColecoVision version as well. For whatever reason, the final TI-99 version has crystals which lack an animation. Which is okay, it's not a big sacrifice, but I definitely appreciate the more interesting looking crystals in the Proto and the Coleco version. Also, you'll notice that the status bar at the bottom in the Proto is totally different from the one in the final game, with the counter for each type of crystal removed in the final version. 
But I think this just makes sense. You're always collecting each of the three crystals in predetermined orders, so you don't really need to count them. You've always got either zero or one of each, and since they can't be collected in an arbitrary order, you're not going to be checking the status bar to see which you still need or how many you have. You're going to be saying, okay, I just got the water crystal, so it's time to get an air crystal, rather than which crystal don't I have yet. It does make sense that they got ditched. And so a couple things got taken out, but there's also a whole lot that just hadn't yet been added in. The game's pretty unfinished, and some areas just aren't populated yet at all. The treasure room and the cave leading to it aren't mapped yet, for example, and the few enemies in the game aren't animated and don't have hit detection. But the good news is the game was finished, and plenty more was added to take it above and beyond the aspirations of the ColecoVision version. It just feels a little more finished across the board vis-a-vis -vis the ColecoVision version, which is funny given ColecoVision Wing War got a full-fledged international release, and TI-99 Wing War was just an unreleased prototype. A few things really helped take the game to the next level in the TI-99 case. For one thing, enemies have complex movement, and they interact with the environment. Spiders make spider webs that you need to avoid. Bees make hives. Or, well, they make something along those lines. Whatever it is, you need to avoid it. <laughs> and another really nice addition to the TI-99 version is voice synth, with several samples used for atmosphere and to indicate game world events. Adventures await, Dragon Monster. The is yours, Master. The volcano is still. In the Coleco version, the spiders just fall from the ceiling. Straight down. That's it. Happily, the TI-99 version seems, on the other hand, to have gotten the extra effort it needed. Another place it gets help is in its difficulty curve, since one of the larger issues with the design is that once you've figured out how to retrieve all three crystals, the game is in danger of becoming just a repeating loop that you play till you get bored. The TI-99 version comes up with a few tweaks that help things in this area. Things that make it genuinely hard to run up the score indefinitely using the basic gameplay structure. One of those is that the world becomes more dangerous as the game progresses, enemies start obstructing your path more, the path to the overworld starts to be obstructed itself, Another is that eggs don't grant extra lives, so lives are a more limited resource. And yet another is that you lose one hit point roughly every 30 seconds and take damage on collisions with the environment. So life isn't just a finite resource, it's also an inherently diminishing one. You're a little closer to death every step of the way. These all seem like sensible tweaks to me. They make the game more replayable and more viable as a high score game. I should say, to be fair to the ColecoVision version, life does deplete over time in the ColecoVision version too, just more slowly, and when it fully depletes, nothing happens. You don't die. You're just a perfectly healthy zero-hit point dragon. Dragon zombie? So just another feature that kinda sorta got implemented, but did it really? As to the larger structure of the gameplay, I like about a Magic's design for Wing War what I like about a Magic's design for Fathom, but a lot more so in this case. I like that it focuses on exploration and adventure. It's one of those rare early 80s adventures that I feel like predicts the Zelda clones that we'd see later on. In the way that it presents the player with a world and some fairly straightforward action and loot mechanics, and then just leaves you to try stuff until you figure out the world's secrets and how it all works. It has a low barrier to entry and plenty to explore right away, but there's a fair bit going on beneath the surface and you'll have to take your time finding it all and just trying things to see what happens and what works and how the world works. That's what I love about TI-99 Wing War. It goes a lot deeper than Fathom does. Fathom is about exploration and discovery, for sure, but there's not much mystery to the world once you've explored the first few levels and explored the basic collection mechanic. 
And that sense of discovery is pretty unique to the TI-99 version of Wing War, out of the four surviving versions, those being ColecoVision 2600, Atari 8-bit, and DI-99. Without the ability to destroy terrain to discover passages and items, all the three other versions are a fair bit more what you see is what you get. Now for all the credit I've given the TI-99 version for its added features and content, there is actually one thing missing from it vis-a-vis -vis the ColecoVision version that I've got to give that one credit for. That one features persistent object tracking between screens so that, say, if you drop a crystal, go to a few other screens and come back, it's still going to be sitting where you left it. Giving the world a sense of permanence, and I think that adds something. But on the other hand, terrain destruction is a big part of the TI-99 game, and it probably wouldn't have been realistic to track terrain damage on a per-tile basis across every screen in the game. So I definitely understand not trying to make the environment persistent when the environment is drastically more changeable in that way. A fair bit else is persistent in the TI-99 Wing War game world, though. Game world events are mostly on a global timer rather than initiated by your entering an area. So while the world mostly isn't permanently malleable, it does feel stateful. An odd addition to the TI-99 version I've so far neglected to mention is the fountains. See, the dragon in the TI-99 Wing War has better hygiene than the dragon in the other versions. Before it can take treasure back to its den to be added to its hoard, it needs to wash it and it washes it in the fountains located in the caves on the way to its den. Any treasures that haven't been cleansed in the fountains won't be added to the dragon's hoard in its den. While this feature doesn't need to be there, it makes the crystal collection process a little more interesting, and it gives the cave some extra character and content. So I definitely think it was a nice addition, which contributes some character and lore to the world. So let's recapitulate. What's TI-99 Wing War trying to do? What does it add to the Wing War formula? And does it succeed? Well, as far as the positives go, we've got the addition of voice synth, which is unique to this version, always appreciated, and here it's done well. We've got terrain destruction as a game mechanic, and an item and area discovery mechanic. That definitely adds something to the game and its world and the mystery of that world. We've got Joust-style flight controls, which I consider preferable to the flight mechanics of the Atari 8-bit and ColecoVision versions. I wasn't a fan of the controls Coleco Fathom inherited from that game's Intellivision version, and so I'm glad TI-99 Wing War is free of them. As far as negatives go for the TI-99 Wing War, the absence of item persistence in the TI-99 version takes a bit away from its sense of being a living world, but not too terribly much, as other things do give it a sense of permanence. But the biggest negative facing TI-99 Wing War by a huge margin historically has just been that there wasn't a TI-99 Wing War manual. And so a pretty weird game that requires a fair bit of explanation came with none for many years. But here we are in the World Wide Web era, when YouTube and Atari Age have the answers to everything. So, hopefully that's not really an issue anymore. I'm trying to do my part to remedy the situation anyway. On the whole, TI-99 Wing War is a great game, and it doesn't come off as unfinished even though it was unreleased. In some ways, it feels more finished than the other versions. So, Wing War makes for a nice farewell to a Magic's time on the TI-99, and its time in the early 80s video game market. What a Magic turned into after 83 was something more or less completely different. Partly shaped by the market's strong swing in the direction of home computers, partly shaped by a Magic's more limited financial means. At the height of the video game boom, a Magic was a company very successfully built from the Activision third-party video game publishing model. But unfortunately, it didn't have as much success as Activision in surviving the hard times that followed the video game boom. Its last three 1983 titles, Quick Step, Laser Gates, and Wing War, were not the successes that they needed in those troubled times. Video Gaming Magazine's December 1983 issue sums up the catastrophe pretty nicely. 
featuring on the one hand the disaster that was the Coleco Atom, and on the other hand the fall of a magic on its cover. And describing that fall in an article titled Tragic Imagic. It tells you just how far a magic had fallen that the graphics and quick step and laser gates get D's across the board in their reviews here. Magic had competed with Activision for its status as the new king of Atari VCS and Intellivision graphics, and now it was beginning to look like the new king of the shovelware that was killing the industry. As for Wing War reviews, there weren't many, since no version sold widely. The Atari 2600 version only sold on a limited basis in Europe, and Magic's marketing really fell off prior to their release. But K-Power Magazine has a review of the ColecoVision version, which is mostly positive, and says, Wing War is a game that'll keep you interested for quite a while. But on the other hand, Electronic Games had a review of the Atari 8-bit Imagic 123 compilation, which basically describes it as the shovelware that it was. And it says, There's not enough here to concern average gamers. The aesthetics of these titles, even outside gameplay, really does sell the shovelware identity at this point. I mean, just look at 2600 Wing Wars box, or the cartridge, or check out Atari 8-bit Wing Wars disc. Definitely gives me that dying industry look and feel. And Wing War definitely was the end of a magic as a leading video game innovator. In Computer and Video Games Magazine's report from Winter CES 84 in January, they reported, This CES was the turn of the American software houses to steal the show. For the last three years, it has been the dedicated video game specialists like Atari, Activision, and Imagic who have stolen the limelight with their award-winning video games and WizKid programmers. But no longer. The new glamour names in American electronic games are software companies like Synapse, Broderbund, Datasoft, and Electronic Arts. Imagic more or less announces its own death shortly thereafter. In March, Computer and Video Games reports that Imagic will no longer be marketing games under the company name. That they essentially plan to be a video game development house only, exiting the game publishing business completely. They didn't do that, actually. Or not immediately, anyway. They continued to bring a few sports, adventure, and educational titles to market over the next couple years. Touchdown Football appears to have been a moderate success for them in 84, while suffering from poor distribution due to their limited means. And in late 84, they hit the high road to adventure, as Enter Magazine puts it, putting out a number of graphical adventures for computers. But by Winter CES 85, things are pretty dire, and all they're announcing is Chopper Hunt, which they didn't even develop. It's a re-release and rebranding of a title previously released independently for Atari 8-bit as Buried Bucks. The latest Magic published title I can find any evidence of is a 1985 Commodore 64 educational title called Talking Teacher. Now, Imagic was definitely looking at C64, IBM PC, and Atari 8-bit as platforms of interest in these last two years, but what about TI-99? Were the rumors of the platform's demise greatly exaggerated? Or was Imagic done with it? Well, they appear to have taken at least some interest. Brian Ropolo, whose name I hope I'm pronouncing correctly, pointed out a Sydney user group newsletter issue that in May 1984 offers an impression of where they stood at that time. That news release promises Demon Attack, Microsurgeon, Moonsweeper, Fathom, and possibly Dragonfire as TI-99 titles coming to the Australian market. So that's interesting in two main respects. Firstly, in that Dragonfire is a possibility which does make plenty of sense. It would have been ridiculously easy to port Coleco Dragonfire to TI-99. It's an undemanding design, and they already had the assets. But the second piece of information here for me is, well, what isn't here, namely Wing War already isn't part of their catalog anymore at this point, at least from the standpoint of the Australian market. But Wing War did survive, of course, so when did that turn up? 
Well, the first mention I can find of it as software in the TI-99 community is in Net99ers May 1984 newsletter when it's listed as a new title added to their disk library of assembly programs. So that would suggest it got leaked into the community pretty much right away. The original planned release date for TI-99 Wing War had been December 83, based on a product status sheet later printed in Micropendium. And a planned December release makes sense, since the very similar ColecoVision version was likewise planned as a Christmas release. Ultimately, while it didn't release for Christmas, it seems like some community members got their hands on it not long after. So, not bad. It also appears in a 1988 compilation disc, Disc 130, from the Lima User Group Library. Uh, since that disc survives, I can confirm that version as the earlier prototype version. Though, evidently, the later one was kicking around too, since in Lima's March 1990 newsletter, Charles Good offers a detailed description of that later version as well, where he describes the speech synthesizer saying in a very realistic voice, Adventures await, Dragon Master, as indeed that version does. Of course, as I say, the problem with encountering Wing War via compilation disc without documentation is, without documentation, most people probably aren't going to get too far. And reflecting that experience, a Tacoma user group member in 1989 asked, Where can one get the directions for Wing Wars? And the response was, I don't know. Does anyone know where to get Wing Wars? I think that's a game that had a dragon flying through gem-filled clouds and into mountain caverns. I saw it years ago. I can't remember where, but I still recall it as having the best graphics ever done for TI. Does anyone out there have Wing Wars, or know what the directions are, or where it can be purchased? Gosh, the internet sure is a wonderful thing, ain't it? Early 80s computer tech sure goes nicely with 2020s computer tech and all the informational conveniences of its day. And so, not only do we now have these answers, we've got easy access to the software anytime we want. So, go give Wing War a play if you haven't before. It's worth it. Normally, when I record a video like this one these days, I post gameplay for the game, along with my review of its history. This time, I don't need to. I've already posted comprehensive gameplay for both the TI-99 Wing War prototype and the final version as well. Those links will be in the description if you need them. And you'll also find there my TI-99 Wing War manual I created based on the lore and style of the other Wing War manuals, and especially the Coleco one but making all the details match the TI-99 version instead. Thanks for watching, folks. This was a long one, but Wing War is a game I really, really like, and Imagic is a company whose history I've become fascinated by. Possibly too fascinated. Hope you enjoyed this trip through its past anyway, and through its contributions to the TI-99 4A. I'm going to have to give some thought to what I cover next on this channel in the realm of TI-99 history, but in the meantime, tell me what you think of Wing War, of Imagic's games, and what your favorite TI-99 games are in general in the comments. This is Pixel Pedant, signing off.